Hello people, good Sunday morning and um, welcome back. This time we're going to have a look at uh, JavaScript timers and how inaccurate they are. Many of you have probably tried to use the built-in timers in JavaScript, uh, the set timeout or set interval, and found out that they really suck, that they're very inaccurate and they tend to drift a lot. So if you want to show a pop-up on your website after a visitor has been visiting for a certain amount of time, then it's no big deal. But if you actually want to use it for something where it's important that it's accurate, then forget about it. It'll only cause you a lot of trouble. Um, so in this video, I'll show you the basics of how the set timeout function works. And I'll show you an example where we play a little simple drum loop using set timeout so you can actually hear for yourself why we shouldn't use it for things like that. And then we'll talk about how we can create a timer that is actually accurate, a timer that is self-adjusting and doesn't drift too much. Finally, we'll make a, a drum machine and it's not going to have a user interface or anything. I just want to show you how it works, how you should actually work with these accurate timers after we have made an accurate timer of our own. So first of all, to illustrate you guys how inaccurate it is, I'll, I'll need some sounds because it's pretty easy to hear how much it, it drifts when it's uh, about sounds. Um, I have used a JavaScript library called Howler for that. And I have another video on this channel, a video about the, um, where I make a drum machine. And you can see how you set up Howler and how you uh, create audio sprites and things like that. So if you want to know more about that, go and check out that video, which is also linked in the description. So this is my setup here. I just have, I have uh, an index HTML file where I load the Howler JavaScript library first, and then I have a link to my own app.js file. Um, and then I have a folder here uh, containing two samples or two audio files, a WebM and an MP3. And inside that, we have four different samples. And let me open up my app.js file. You can see I am initializing an instance of uh, a howl here, which is a sound um, an audio sprite. It's, it's basically just one, uh, one sound file, and then it tells the JavaScript where it should start playing the file and where it ends. So, but the thing about it is that you can play a sample with it. And I have four different samples here, a clap, a hi-hat, a kick, and a snare. So to be able to hear this, of course, you have to open up a browser and you can just right click on your index HTML file and open with live server. But that, of course, you need to have live server extension installed here. You can do that uh, by installing the extension. Uh, it's really nice to have. And then I will right click on it and open with live server. And let me see if I can scooch it over here. There's nothing on the page right now. It's totally empty. But when I go back here and in my app.js, I, I play the drum sound clap. So every time I save this, I'll hear the clap. I can change that to the kick drum or every time I save. And we can try with the snare as well. So that's how we're going to play drums in this tutorial. But let's first have a look at how the set timeout in JavaScript actually works. I am going to delete this line of code so we don't have the snare playing all over the place. And uh, I'm just going to do this so we have more space. So a set timeout. Uh, it's pretty simple, actually. We can, um, we can create a set timeout. We can just go set timeout. And then what we pass to that set timeout is a callback function and inside that callback function we put the code that we want to execute after x amount of milliseconds so let me illustrate that so i'm just going to pass in the callback function first and that's an arrow function and we're just going to console log we're just going to console log it ran and then after the callback function we're just going to pass in let's say 1000 milliseconds, which is the same as one second. And then we should, uh, when we save this, I'm just going to get our browser here. We already have the console open. So if I go like this and, and we save that, then after about one second, we should see it ran. So I'm going to save that now. And it came about after one second, we can change that to two seconds. It's going to take two seconds. We can change it to one quarter of a second, which is going to run pretty fast. So that's basically how it works. Uh, but another cool thing about it is that the set timeout function always returns a um, an ID of the timeout that you're actually creating. So if we 
put that into timer ID. Let's just call it that equals set timeout. Then we're actually going to be able to use this timer ID to cancel the timeout. Um, it will still run if I if I save this. You will still see it ran after a quarter of a second. Let's just try with one second again. It's still gonna go there. But if we wanna uh, cancel it, we can do that as well. I'm just gonna set this to, let's say, five seconds. And we're gonna wait five seconds. It's gonna come. It's gonna say it ran and it did after five seconds. But because we already saved this in, in a constant here, in a variable timer ID, so I can go clear timeout and then I can pass in the timer ID. We just got to do that in the console here and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna run this before I actually save this and this runs again. So now it's running and it's gonna show in five seconds that it ran. Okay, let's try again. I'm gonna run it and now I'm gonna clear the timeout and it never finished running. It actually breaks out of this uh, timeout that is uh, currently happening. So that's how you can cancel a timeout. And that is something that will come in handy later in this tutorial. Let's move on. So now that you know how it works, let's continue. And um, I'm just going to delete this one here. Now I want to illustrate to you guys how how inaccurate it actually is when we try to play a drum loop. So let's set up a few functions here. I'm going to start with creating a function that plays the kick drum. Play kick. And that function, all it should do is actually just play the, the, the kick. So I'm going to set a timeout. And inside here, we are going to just play the kick. So we take the drums and we play we play the kick sound, the one from up here, this one here. All right. And then after that, I'm just going to run this function here again. So it's just a function that calls itself. It's called recursion. So it'll just run indefinitely. There's no way to break out of it, but that's okay for now. I just want to show you how, how inaccurate it is. So I'm just going to go play kick. like that. And it's not going to run now because we haven't set anything to run it, but we need to set a time interval here. And let's play it every 500 milliseconds, which is every half a second. I'm going to save that. And let's just try to call it here. So play kick. I'm going to save it. And you're going to hear like a techno beat, like a nice and steady beat. And right now it's pretty hard to hear that it's uh, that it's drifting. But as soon as we add some other drums, you will be able to hear it much more clear. I'm just going to comment this out and save it again to get rid of this. We are going to do the same for, for all of our drums here. I'm just, or for some of them. So I'm going to go play snare and I want that to be this snare. And I want it to not be every half second. I want it to be every one second. And let's have the the hi hat play. And we're gonna play the hi hat sound. And it's gonna be every quarter of a second, like that. And that would be nice to, if you actually had a way to start this. So let's just add a button here in our HTML. And start test, let's call it that. And we're going to type on click. Oops, on click equals. Let's just play or start test. Just going to do that from our HTML here. I'm going to save that. We don't have a start test yet, but let's create that down here. So start test that's going to be a function of course and inside our 
start test, we're going to run all of them at the same time. So play kick, play snare, and play hi-hat. And let's have a look at the browser. And we have a nice button here. And this is going crazy. Okay, that, that's totally wrong. I'm just going to save this again to stop it. And of course, that's because I don't want to run the play kick every time I want to play snare. And this should be play hi-hat. Okay, let's try again. It's a beat. And it sounds okay in the beginning, but listen. Now you can hear it's beginning to drift. Wow, it's totally out of time, totally out of sync. Okay. So over time, it tends to drift. Let me just tr try one more time. You can hear in the beginning, it sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty decent, but then over time, it loses a lot of uh, milliseconds and it starts to drift and it uh, just sounds like shit. All right, so far pretty good, but now you can hear. That's not a good drummer. That's a very bad drummer, bad drummer. So how can we make a timer that is more accurate, that doesn't drift like this? Well, before we start doing that, we should uh, be able to get like a fixed point in time that is very accurate. Um, and a way to do that is to use the JavaScript date now function. Let me go to the console and let me show you right here. If you go here in the console and you type date with a capital D and then now dot now, you will get a number here. And every time I run this, you'll get a different number. Now it's uh, it ends on a nine. Now it ends on a one. And um, this is actually, this number is precise down to one millisecond, and it will give you the number of milliseconds elapsed since January 1st, 1970. And that's, uh, that's, that's when they were making Unix back in the days, back in the 60s. They needed uh, a way to calculate time in programming languages and computers. So they came up with this thing, and it's, it's accurate down to one millisecond. So, um, so the 1st of January, 1970, they started with one, then two, and then they incremented it for every single millisecond and uh, it's still going strong. So uh, we can use this number to calculate, to see what the drift is. And it's accurate, as I said, down to one millisecond. So that's pretty, that's good enough for us right now. So let's make a test so we can see how much it's actually drifting, how inaccurate it is. So I'm going to get rid of all of this stuff and I'm going to make a function. I'm going to call it uh, start test because we already have this one in here that will start the test for us. So let's keep that. And in this function, I am, the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna console lock that we actually started. All right, so whenever we click the button, we'll see started. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is, um, I am going to set the cured time, the start time that we actually start this one. So, so I'm going to call that start time. And that is going to be the number that we just talked about. So that's going to be date, date dot now. All right. So now we have a fixed point in time. This is when we start this function that is called start te test, one of the first things we're going to get is the start time, what time it is right now in milliseconds. And then we're going to make a function here. I'm going to put it into a variable, um, call it round because we want this to run. It's a round that we want to run for every second, for every whatever we pass into this set timeout. That's going to set that equal to a function, an arrow function. And the reason it's an arrow function is so we can access uh, the outer scope here, the start time. So the first thing we can do is actually just set the timeout here. But I would like to be able to cancel the timeout with the clear timeout that we talked about before. So before this function, I'm just going to set a variable here and call it timeout. We're not going to give it a value or anything, just uh, like this. And 
then inside our function here we will take that timeout variable and set it equal to our set timeout. And then that way we get the ID inside the timeout. So we can cancel it later on. And first we're gonna pass an arrow function like that. And then we're going to pass how many seconds we want it, how, how often we want this to run. Let's just run it for every 1000 milliseconds. Then we would like to get the elapsed time, the time that actually elapsed since we started this test up here. Because we get this one and then we want to find out what time is it now. So I can set a variable here and call it elapsed time. And that would be, that of, would of course be the date now and then minus the start time that we set up here all right let's just try and console log that so like this i'm gonna save it go back to the browser and i'm gonna start the test and nothing is happening because, of course, we need to initialize the function. Otherwise, it will not run. So let's do that down here. So we're just going to take the round and we're going to execute it, this one here. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So I'm going to start the test. It started and I get 1000, which is interesting. I'm going to start it again. I get 1001. So the first time it didn't drift at all. It was totally accurate. This time, the second time was only one milliseconds off. Sometimes this time it was three milliseconds off. This time only one. So you can see it's drifting all the time. This time's four. So when you add all of these numbers up, when they get to a thousand, like you're one second off and that's why it starts to uh, gradually drift. So let's try and run this over and over again so we can actually see how much the drift adds up to. And to do that, it will be nice to have like a total time. Just start from zero up here. So just total time is going to be zero to begin with. And then for every time we run this timeout here, we're going to add 1000 to it because we're passing in 1000. So we can subtract that and get a number. We're just going to here, just going to make a comment, increment total time. We're just going to take the total time and add a thousand to it every time. And this number should of course be whatever you pass into the timeout as uh, as your time interval. So, oh, something happened here. I'm just gonna move that down to the next line. Then we can console log the total drift instead. So the way to do that is we just, uh, let me type out total drift. And we're going to take the elapsed time we're going to subtract the total time from that. All right. And then after this, we are going to run the round again. So, so what's happening here? Well, first we are, when we run the start test function, the first thing we're going to do is actually run the round, which is the function up here. And inside this, we're setting a timeout. And we're setting that timeout equal to the timeout variable that we create up here. So we have a way to stop it later on. And then we set the timeout and we increment the total time by 1000 because we pass in 1000 every time. And then we find out how much time actually elapsed. So we take the current time and we subtract the start time from that, which is set when we run this the first time. And then we we console log the elapsed time minus total time, which will give us. Yeah, let's just see. I'm going to save this. I'm going to go back to the browser. I'm going to start the test. So the first time it drifted, it drifted five. Then the next round it drifted two. So it's seven. So it's it's adding up here, as you can see. For every second, we are losing an amount of milliseconds here and it's adding up to 48 50 and after a while it's gonna it's gonna be up to 1000 which is means that it's one second behind and something crazy happened here you know it's uh something is definitely going on 
So it's drifting all over the place, which is not good. Let's just add, it would be nice to have a way to stop this one here. And this is I'm just going to add another button in our HTML. And this is going to be stop test. Stop test. Let's inside our JavaScript actually have a stop test. And that is actually going to take this timeout here and clear it. So I'm just going to take clear timeout. Oops, that's not the right one. It's called timeout. So that should stop it. Let's go back to our browser and see we have a stop test button here. We start the test. It starts counting five, six, eight, and so on. And now we stop it. Oh, cleat timeout. Maybe I should spell it like this instead. Let's try one more time. Start the test. It starts running. And if I stop the test, it's going to stop. I'm just going to console log let it actually stop so we can see what's going on hey so that should work now it started it's drifting all over the place and it stopped so we can start we can stop the timeout and we can see how much it's drifting so how can we make an accurate timer that doesn't drift well we just figured out how to get the number of milliseconds that uh, the timeout drifted that's the one that adds up all the time that we saw in the console before. And if we know that for every single iteration of the round, then we can just take the original time interval here and we can subtract the drift from that and run the next round with that as, uh, as the parameter, as the time interval parameter. So the timeout will correct itself. It will adjust itself for every round. It will find out how much longer did I take this time? And if I took like five milliseconds longer than I should, than the distance of time from this here was, then I can take 1000 if it is 1000 and I can subtract that number from that. And then I can run the next round again with that number. So to illustrate that I have, um, I made this spreadsheet here. Here I ran a timer 30 times and I recorded the current time for every iteration, which is column B here. And then I compared it to the expected time, which is B2. So this is the timestamp from the from the very beginning when we run this function the first time, round one. Uh, in column C, you can see the drift. And I got that from um, taking the initial time, the expected time here, and then subtracting the current time per iteration around this number here in column B. And of course, we need to add 1000 milliseconds for every round. So I um, I took that into account as, as well. So you can see in the first round, we get a drift of five. Then the next one is one, one, five, one, one, four, and so on and so forth. So if we just take the, the time interval that we pass into the set timeout function and we subtract the drift, then we know that the next round, we need to run it with this time interval. And the next round again, this, and this, and this, and so on and so forth. Then it will never be 100% accurate, but it's pretty stable and it doesn't drift a lot over time. And as you can see on this sheet, I, I calculated the average drift here. So I just took all of these and divided by 30 because I ran it 30 times. And the maximum, you know, the, the average drift is 3.8. So that's pretty stable. That's good enough for, for most things. So let's go back to our editor and let's start coding an, an accurate timer that takes this into account. So let's go back to the code and let's just delete everything we have so far, except for the, for the drums up here, because we're going to need that later to demonstrate. It would be pretty cool if we could make a timer as a constructor function so we can create all the timer instances that we want in our app. So let's begin by declaring a constructor function. It's going to be a function, of course, and it's let's call it timer and with a capital T because it's a constructor. Um, first of all, we need to get the callback that we want to run for every iteration. So I'm just going to receive that here. And we, of course, we need the time interval as well. All right. Inside here, we can set the time interval to this object that we are creating. So that is just going to be this time interval equal time interval. And I need to 
spell that with an M up here. Okay, then we're gonna add a method to this here to start the timer. We're gonna go this because it's still the same object that we're creating here. And we're gonna call it start, that makes sense. We're gonna make that an arrow function. And we're going to add something in here. And we also need a way to stop this. So let's just set that on the instance as well. Stop. And that will be an arrow function as well. Or a method. And then we're going to need the round, the one that we used in the last example. So we're going to set this round. That's also going to be a function or a method again. Oh my goodness. Okay, like this. So now we have that. So let me just, um, this will be start timer. And this will, of course, that makes sense. Stop timer. This will be the method that takes care of running our callback. And adjusting the time interval. All right, so let's start by adding the code to start. First of all, we need to get the expected time. So I'm gonna go with this expected, set that property on the instance, and I'm gonna do the date dot now. And we are going to add the time interval that we passed in, which is this time interval. And the reason we do that is uh, we're setting the moment we start this one here, we're setting the what, what time is it now in milliseconds since 1970. And then we're adding the time interval because that is the expected time. When this has run one time, we want to check what is it actually after the time interval you, you pass in. So we're gonna add the time interval here. Just gonna add a comment here and set expected time. And then we need to run it. So we're gonna have to create um, the timeout so we can stop it again. So I'm gonna put that on the instance. So this timeout, I'm gonna set that equal to our set timeout, the built-in JavaScript function here. And the, we're gonna run this round, which is the one we added here. And how often are we going to run that? We're going to run that this time interval, the one we passed in here. That's what we're going to do. And I'm just going to add a console log here to see that we actually started. So OK. That should take care of that. And let's continue with the with the stop method here. We already had this the timeout set. So what we can just do is clear the timeout. And that's the one we set up here, this timeout. So this dot timeout. So let's take care of that. That's all we need to do. I'm gonna console log that we stopped. just so we know what's going on when we go to test this. And this is where the interesting stuff will take place. We need some content here. It would make sense if we just run the callback that we uh, that we receive here. And we didn't set this on the instance, so we're just gonna callback like this and run the callback. So let's just try and see what happens here. We're gonna make a new timer here. Let's just call it my timer. And we're gonna use the new keyword to make a new instance of this. New, new timer, we're gonna pass in. I'm just gonna pass in something very simple. Just console log something. It ran. Something like that, and then we're gonna pass in. Let's do it for every second. And then we can run the start method on this my timer now. Let it rip. It ran. So I'm just going to save this again, go back, 
and then after a second it ran. So it looks like it's, it's kind of working now. Let's continue. Before we do anything, before we call the callback, before we run that, we want to calculate the drift as we talked about earlier. So I'm going to set a variable here. I'm just going to call it drift because that's completely self-explanatory. And then I'm going to take the date dot now, the current moment in time. And I am going to subtract the expected time, which we already set on in the instance. We set that when we started the first time and then we set the drift for every single time. And we will also set that this expected when after we run the callback. So after we run the callback here, we're going to take that this expected and we're just going to add the time interval for every single round. That makes sense, right? We expect it to be whatever we started uh, from here and plus the time interval that we pass into it. So uh, that's gonna be this time interval, okay? This will only run once as we saw before. So we have to set a new timeout to keep it running and we need to update our timeout property too. Before we do anything else, I just wanna console log the drift here. So console log the drift. Let's go back to the browser and check it out. Okay, it ran. I'm just going to reload it. Never mind this stuff here. So we have a drift of two. We have a drift of four. We have a drift of zero. That means it's accurate. And now we got one of one. So we just need to set, we need to update our timeout here and we need to set a new timeout. And uh, so we just access this timeout. And we set that equal to a new timeout, set timeout. And we want to run the round one more time. So that's just going to be this round. But now it's pretty interesting because we want to take the time interval and we want to subtract the drift. So we can take this time interval and subtract the drift. So the next round will run, in this case, 1000 minus whatever we have as a drift. So now it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. But let me just uh, illustrate this by also just console login. What is the this timeout minus drift? So time interval minus drift. So, so that makes sense, right? You can see like um, we don't have a time to way to stop it. Actually, we do. We have my timer, my timer dot stop, which will take care of that. So, so that's we're running this uh, stop method up here. So we can see. Okay, the first time it runs, it's uh, it's drifting three milliseconds. So we take one thousand and we subtract three. And the uh, same thing here, actually every single time here, we're down to two, so it's gonna be 998 because we're using 1000 milliseconds. We can try with something else here, just 500, and uh, it's gonna do the same thing, you know? So that's, uh, that's pretty cool, that's pretty interesting. And we can go ahead and we can stop it again with this method. So now we should have an accurate timer, so we should probably test it. But before we use it for playing drum loops, let's um, let's have another look at what's going on here. Uh, I'm gonna open a new tab here and another one here. It's just gonna be empty. I'm gonna start it again. Actually, I can just go my timer start. I don't need to save again like that. Um, you can see the drift is like five, four. It's changing between this. And then I'm gonna Change that and you can see, oh my God, what's going on here? The, the drift is suddenly totally crazy. So I'm just gonna stop the timer here and then gonna scroll up and you can see that it's all over the place. The drift is 957 and that's because in Chrome, every time you change to another tab, it's not going to allow the inactive tab to, uh, to have a timer running very often. And the reason for that is uh, performance. It doesn't want a lot of timers to run in different tabs all the time while you're actually working on something else because that takes a lot of uh, power from the CPU and uh, the performance will be lower. So there's not much we can do about that. But if you want to add a check for that inside our function here, our constructor, we can do that as well. We can pass it an error function that will be run 
if the time interval, the drift is larger than the time interval we pass into it. So uh, let's let's do that. Um, so I'm just going to call it pass in another error function here. Or just call it error callback. Oh, not like that. Just before the callback here, we should check just before we run the main callback that we want to execute, we should check if if the drift is greater than the time interval, then something really weird happened. But inside here, if we have an error callback, if we passed in this, then, then we should actually just execute it. So. Right, and then if you want to have some basic stuff, you can just add some some code here, right? Oops. But otherwise, we're just gonna call the error call back. So this is a little check. So maybe I should just write a little comment here. Check if uh, drift is greater than time interval and run error callback. If true. Okay, let's try and check this. After this, I am going to add another callback. And we just want a console log error if something is wrong. Okay, so let's see if that works. Let's go to the, this one here. It's running and running it's going crazy I'm gonna change the tab go back here mess around a little bit here and then go back whoa something's going on here let's just stop it again like that and uh, you can see if we scroll up okay we get the error so it works so if the user is messing around in different tabs and doing different stuff in the browser uh, it will not really it will not work but you have a way of uh, taking that into account, so you can uh, you can display a pop up or something like that that says we st we stopped the timer, we stopped the task that you were doing because that uh, you messed around with the <laughs> with the task. Please don't do that if you want this to be accurate and precise. But now at least you have the the opportunity to do so. So one thing I just want to do here is go back to the index file because I need a way to start these things. Uh, so we we still have the start and the stop button here. Why not use it? Just going to create the functions again. Start test. And we're just going to take our my timer and start that. Right. And then we're going to add a stop. I'm just going to copy this because I'm lazy. And we're going to call it stop test. All right, and then my timer stop. And then we don't need to run it here. Let's just check fast if it works. Let's start the test. It ran, it ran, it ran. I stopped the test and it stops. Okay, good. Now those are hooked up. So let's try and hook up the drum samples now. I will run, I will create a timer instance for every single drum I want to play here. And uh, first, let's create the kick. I'm going to set that to a new instance of the timer. So new timer, and then we're going to pass the first function here, the callback function as an arrow function. And what we're going to do is just play. We're going to take the drums. I think that's what it's called. We have the constant here with the drums with Howler JS giving us the opportunity to play these samples here. So I'm going to take the drums and play the kick. Okay, and we want to do that, let's say, every 500 milliseconds. Just like that. And we're not going to start it yet. We're just going to set it. And then we're going to take the... Actually, let's see if this works. So I'm just going to take the kick and start that and stop the kick. Oop. 
when we press the stop button. All right, let's try it out. Wow, looks like it's working. Stop the test and it stops. Let's try and do this with the other samples. So this is gonna be the snare. We want that to be, to play the snare. And every, let's say thousand. And the hi-hat. It's gonna be the hi-hat and every 250 milliseconds. Then we gotta take this. We gotta take this, start the snare and the hi-hat and we're gonna stop them here and that's gonna be the snare and the hi-hat okay let's try it out again let's start it wow that's not bad that's pretty accurate not drifting all over the place like before but still there's something wrong right there's something going on there's something off if you listen to it after some time you will hear that it's not 100% accurate and of course that makes sense because we're using we're running a timer a separate timer for every single sample that we're playing so eventually they will they will drift as well but it's much, much better than it was before. But it's still not good enough for us. So another way we can do that is actually we should only use one timer to play all these, these uh, samples and to play a drum loop. And I'm gonna show you, this is kind of out of the scope. We already created the accurate timer. And if you don't need to know this, then just stop the video and go on with your life. But if you want to know how we can make a little sequencer, just a very simple one, then uh, keep watching. All right, let's get rid of this. And a good way of visualizing a drum beat is something like this. I'm just going to paste this in and explain what it is that you see here. And as you can see here, we have an array of objects and um, there's an object for each track. And every object has a property with the sample name that is equivalent to the sample names defined up here in Howler.js. And we have a track matrix as well, which is basically just um, an array with uh, 16 ones or zeros. And those 16 spots in the array, they each represent a 16th note. So the resolution of our beat will be uh, down to 1 16th. So number one will play this sample here and uh, zero will not play it. So that's basically how it's going to work. So the callback function that we pass to our timer will run for every 16th note in whatever BPM beat per minute we, uh, we select, we choose that we want to play this, the tempo, right? So we will need to actually define a BPM. So let's try and do that. And um, we need to know something. We need to know that one minute, so I'm just gonna type this in here, one minute. That is actually 60,000 milliseconds, right? And the way that we can uh, convert beats per minute BPM to milliseconds, because we're gonna need that, uh, we will take the 16 or 60,000 milliseconds and we will divide that with the BPM, right? And then we will get the duration of a quarter note. And then we want to get the 16th note. So we can take the 60,000 milliseconds. We could divide that by the BPM. And then we could divide that again by four, right? This one here is a quarter note. This is a quarter note, but then we have four units inside a quarter note. So we divide it by four. So now we're down to um, to the milliseconds for um, how often this timeout should run. But of course we are going to need to set the BPM. So let me just let BPM, let's say we want to run it at 100 BPM, okay? 
And then let's just set the tempo here. Let, what should we call it, millisecond tempo. And we're going to set that equal to 60,000. I'm going to put it in parentheses. So 60,000 divided by the BPM. And then we're going to divide that by 4. Okay. That's good. Just going to move this up here just for reference. Okay. And then we need to create the callback function that we want to run for every single time the interval runs. So let's just call that drums to play whatever. That's going to be a function. And first of all, we want to check if our beat count, if uh, where we are, are we at number one? Are we at number two? Are we at number three? Where are we? Um, so before we begin, I want to also create a beat count variable here and set it to zero just to begin with. And inside this function, I want to check where are we? Are we at number one? Are we zero? Are we? Where are we? Uh, should I play or shouldn't I play? So I'm going to create an if statement here. And I'm going to check if the beat count, if it is 16, that means we start from zero. So this is number zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 15. So we, if we exceed this, uh, which is actually number 17, because we're talking about 16th, but because it's zero based, then uh, we're up to only 16. So if we are exceeding this, then we want we want to just reset the beat count to zero. So okay. And then we want to run a loop. So I'm gonna run a for loop and I'm just gonna set the iterator let i equal zero to begin with. And then as long as the i is less than the length of the drum tracks you know so we only want to run if we have like we have four here so we only want to run this four time or we want to run for each single one of it so we call it drum tracks so oops drum tracks length and then we want to increment i okay so we just want to let me type a comment here when the track matrix value is one play the sample okay so we're going to have to check if drum tracks i and the first time that will be this one the second time around will be this one as you know if that track matrix value of beat count if that is equal to one that means that we have a one here then we need to do something but as you know it's going to be uh, it's going to be zero the first time we pass it in so it's going to take the first one so we need to increment but uh, right here this is where we want to play the drum sample right so just play drum sample and we're just going to take the drums and we're going to play what are we going to play we are going to play the drum tracks i the current one that we're currently in and we're just going to access the sample name here because that's what we have defined up here as well so right so that should work, but it's not going to work now because it's going to be zero. The beat count is going to be zero every time. So it's just going to play this over and over and over again. Um, so that's not going to work. So down here, we want to increment for every time we run this drums to play function. At the end of it, we want to increment the, um, the beat count. Plus plus by one. So basically what we're doing here is the first thing we're checking is is the beat count already 16? Well, then you have to start over. So we're just going to reset it to, to zero. 
So it starts from this position again. And then we're checking for each single uh, object we have in the drum tracks array. We are going to take when the mate <laughs> when this one here is equal to one, we are going to um, so the first time around it's going to be zero. So we've got to check this one here. And if it's equal to one, then we're going to play the sample and then we're going to increment. So the next time it's going to be one. So it's going to check this one for each and every single one of them. Does that make sense? I hope so. Anyways, let's see if it works. So we're just going to make a new timer here. We're going to call it drum loop. We're going to set that to our new timer. And what we're going to pass into this one, we already created the function here. So we're just going to drums to play this one. And then we are going to type in the MS tempo. So that's the BPM tempo or the tempo of what whatever a 16th note in this BPM would be. All right. And then we have our start test. We still have our buttons hooked up from the index HTML. So I'm just going to go uh, start. And I'm just going to start the drum loop. Like that. And we're going to have a stop test as well. I'll space it out a little bit so it's easier to see what's going on. It's going to be stop. And we're going to stop it. Just like that. Let's check it out in the browser. Oh, something is going on. Beat count is not defined. Where is that? 88. Okay. That's because it's a it's with a capital C, so that's it right there. Let's try again. Oh, sample name. Okay. <laughs> That's probably correct. Sample name. Let's call it that instead. Let's try one more time. Hopefully it works this time. Okay. Sample name of undefined. Why is that? And of course, that doesn't make any sense because I don't know why I did that. It's going way too fast for me. This should be the drum tracks, right? I mean, not. Okay, that should be it. Let's try one more time. Hopefully, it works. Wow, that's pretty cool. We can stop it here, and we can go and we can change this here. If we want, like, uh, kick drums here and there, it's not going to sound very good. But we can just change it to a. And we can put in a snare here, and here. Save that, go back to the browser. Pretty cool. Another cool thing is um, we are, because we set this up here, we set the, the time interval, then we're able to actually change the time um, if we want to do that while it's still running. So let's try that. I'm just going to start the test. And this one is called. So we can take our drum loop and we can set the time interval and we can set it to something like, let's try 500. And while it's still running, listen to this. Now it's totally slowed down. You can set it to something else. And of course this is still milliseconds, so we still need to calculate the BPM value. So while it's still running, let's speed it up a little bit. And let's just stop it. So that's how it works. And this is accurate. This drum loop is much, much more accurate than we um, than the one we made before because it's only using one one timer, the same timer that checks for the values here for every single time. I actually wanted to make a tutorial on how to uh, make a, a drum machine like this. And um, but I felt that I needed to explain how the accurate timer works before I do that. So it would be way too much in that tutorial to talk about this timer because this is like a um, 
a subject in itself. So one of the upcoming tutorials on this channel is going to be how to make a drum machine with a user interface. So, um, but anyways, I hope you liked the video. I hope you understand everything that's going on. Otherwise, leave a comment in the, in the comment section and uh, reach out. And if you have any ideas, um, yeah, please let me know. Please like, share, hit the bell, all that good stuff, you know. Yeah, that's how you make an accurate timer in JavaScript. See you next time.